If he is to be believed, President Putin has deployed the avant-garde system with military units. It's a hypersonic capability. We know that China has the Dongfeng 17 under development and very soon we'll be able to deploy that. We cannot just sit on our hands and be caught um, unaware as this threat develops. Hypersonic glide vehicles are boosted by a rocket motor to a low apogee. They then separate and can glide without propulsion in the upper atmosphere for thousands of kilometres at a speed of up to 20,000 kilometres an hour. The gliders are able to perform manoeuvres throughout their flight path to evade defence measures and to conceal their final target. Hence, these gliders may have a target footprint ranging up to 1,000 kilometres in length and width. Hypersonic glide vehicles like the Russian Avangard and the Chinese Dongfeng 17, it's claimed have a technology readiness level of up to eight with initial operational capability. Then there's hypersonic cruise missiles. These can be ground or air launched and are boosted by a rocket motor to their cruise altitude up to 30 kilometers and a speed of up to five and a half thousand kilometers an hour. Then the cruise missile separates and performs a powered flight with a range of about 1,000 kilometers. These cruise missiles will use a supersonic combustion ramjet, a so-called scramjet, and they can fly at a speed of up to 10,000 kilometers an hour and are capable of stronger maneuvering than the glide vehicles. Hypersonic cruise missiles are under development in the USA, Russia and China and are assessed to have a technology readiness level of six with initial operational capability expected within a few years. Well, the development and fielding of hypersonic weapons is going to have a revolutionary effect, I think, on the strategic security situation. Uh, this is a threat that will enable the delivery of key weapons, uh, key munitions, vastly more rapidly uh, than is the case right now with intercontinental ballistic missiles or cruise missiles or other delivery means. Hypersonic weapon systems are maneuverable. That's actually what makes them a game changer compared to weapon systems that are not maneuverable or limited maneuverability like a ballistic missile system. So that's actually one of the elements that makes them a game changer. The detection of hypersonic weapon systems is challenging due to the fact that usually when you have a look at the current sensors used for air defense, the radars, they are on the ground. And due to the curvature of the Earth, you have a horizon and you can only detect a target at a specific distance depending on the altitude. When you have a ground radar and think about an intercontinental ballistic missile, they are flying something like 3,000 kilometers altitude. So a ground-based radar could look into space and detect the, the uh, incoming warhead early in a way that you would have at least 15 or 20 minutes sometimes before the impact. When you think about the hypersonic weapon systems coming at 30 kilometers altitude, you would have probably something like 700 kilometers, which then gives you two minutes or two and a half minutes depending on the speed. We need to understand that the speed that a hypersonic vehicle operates at now takes away any chance for there being human intervention in this chain. It's not impossible to defend. Does something exist right now which covers defence against all aspects of hypersonic weapons? No. And therefore we do need to think about defence. And in the missile age we need to think much more end-to-end -end about missile defence anyway. So this is a, a useful addition to that strand of research. 
Really? We are a uh, defensive setup alliance. So first of all, if I look towards air power, the question is always uh, what will it change uh, on the defensive side uh, from all the sorts, uh, from all the doctrines we have, from the operational requirements we have. So first of all, it needs to be investigated uh, if we have to adopt our missile defense system, if we have to adopt uh, uh, the technology and so forth. There is some similarity uh, between the introduction of nuclear weapons and the potential introduction of hypersonic weapon systems. Um, each posed a very significant new threat, but we should also recognize that it also poses a very, very significant threat to countries that use it if they elicit a response uh, that is going to be significant. I think the first point to make is that arms control arrangement, what does it seek to do? It seeks to reduce uncertainty, it seeks to increase transparency, and it seeks to govern and regulate weapons. The second uh, point to make is that arms control arrangements offer a wide range of instruments and tools and approaches. There is no one arms control uh, tool or instrument. Uh, arms control can look at measures of restraint, measures of uh, export arrangements, it can negotiate behavior, it can facilitate communication and transparency. So depending on what is the issue or where do we seek to regulate and reduce uncertainty, arms control instruments can support. Well, the technology has been known about, has been talked about for many years. I think we're moving from a theory to reality. In this case, if we do nothing, this could take a very bad form. If hypersonic weapons become fielded realities, then we must react. And so when we take a subject such as this seriously, which we do, then we will give priority to it. And we're at that stage right now to understand the technology much better to use the, the international uh, strength of the, the NATO Science and Technology Organization to its maximum so that we can decide what to do. We cannot afford not to respond. And part of that response has to be a detailed, urgent, technical understanding of the threats and risks we face.